Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sonia Holtz. I'm the CFWC Communications Chairman and the host for this afternoon's ESO meeting. We'll be starting in just a minute. Thank you so much for attending. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to see all of you here. My internet connection is telling me it's unstable, so who knows what might happen today. Uh, but I know you'll enjoy our speaker. We have 119 people signed up to be at this event today, which is fantastic. I hope you all had a great lunch. If we were together, we would have had a fabulous lunch and been talking just as we are now. I want to start today with giving out some achievement awards because since this term started in 2020, you have all been very, very busy sending in your ESO achievements and asking questions. I'm so thrilled about that. Uh, we're really getting some interest going up here. Um, so let Sonia, if we can go on to our awards PowerPoint. Okay, just before we start that, let's do some housekeeping, please. Yes, you participate. Let's make sure that you know how to raise your hand on the bottom of your screen. There should be something that says raise your hand. Or if you don't have that kind of ability, then you go to your personal square, the three dots and you can raise your hand and lower your hand that way. We really want to know that you can raise your hand and ask questions when you have questions. The second thing is the chat is not for chat. The chat is used for question and answer. And for ESO today, our chat organizer is, well, I can help her. So I can help her make sure that we do question and answers from chat. So please keep the chat to question and answers, please, especially with a very special speaker. So uh, the other thing, thing yes. it's me. I'm is it Peggy? Here. I'm sorry, Peggy. I okay. had your name in here and then it was scratched out and then put in again. So I didn't want to assume. All it's right. Me. So Peggy will it. be our chat question and answer person. Oh, no, no. I'm just the hands. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Whatever Thank you, you Peggy. Right. Thank you very much. All right. So um, if you need to leave for a minute and you don't want everyone to see that you're leaving for a minute, you go to the bottom left hand side of your screen. You go to stop video. You're not leaving the meeting. It's just stopping your video from showing us what's going on in your room. And uh, so that's important. If you have a child that runs in the room or, and you need to pay attention and you don't want that to be on the recording. We are recording all of our meetings this weekend. So keep that in mind. Um, the next thing is uh, I need to ask permission to take photos. I am your CFWC communications chair, but also your photographer. And I would like to be able to take photos and put those out about us this weekend. We are asking that if you have a special photo and a special outfit for a certain meeting, please take that photo as a selfie or have a family member take that photo and send that to CFWC communications at gmail.com. And we would love to have that kind of photo. Everyone's kind of tired of seeing the gallery shots on, e on the Facebook page. So let's send some fun stuff in. All right, so the next one is if you are a delegate, we need your help. Um, when you come in these rooms, we'd like you to rename yourself into whatever position you're coming to the meeting as. And then at behind your name, we'd like you to put the letter D. To do that, you wanna to go to the frame, your frame with your mouse. When it highlights, you go to the three little dots. You go to rename and you can put in your name, your position and the letter D if you're a delegate. And that will help us with the credentials as we're going through all of the meetings. Okay, so are there any questions about any of that? I think we're pretty good at this by now, right? Okay, very good. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the uh, slideshow. I'm gonna go ahead and mute. Shirley, back to you. Okay, great. There have been so many things going on. Uh, I know I'm a little up in the air about what we're doing at any given moment, and I'm sure you must be a little nuts. Can everyone see the, the PowerPoint? Do you have it full screen? Since uh, June, May of 2020 through May of 2021, we have had an amazing amount of um, people send in their achievements. 
they're really uh, logging what they're reading. I know you're all reading a ton and we're going to have centuries coming out of our ears here pretty soon. So these are all the folks that have been recognized for this last fiscal year. Next slide. We're starting, we're going to the districts in alphabetical order. So we're starting with De Anza district. Look at all those folks that reached member level. Um, off of pledge into member, Gloria Bachrath, Beverly Marshall, Marlon Carrier, Phyllis Roos, Lupi Ramos Ameth, and Debbie Stoffel. Temecula Valley Women's Club has been very busy getting their paperwork in. And next year, yes, <laughs> next year we're going to have even more slides with people. Um, Mickey Reed has reached torch level, third level up. 64 books with 16 categories. That's just amazing. Women's Club of India has also been very, very busy. Next slide. The Anza District just keeps on going. Century level. Each century is 100 books. So Reggie's done 200 books now. Kay Mason Brink has finished 300 books. And Susan Elliott, 900 books. That's phenomenal. Look at that. Hemet Women's Club, Temecula Valley, still going. I love it. Next slide. Loma Prieta, we have three new members. Tony Gerland from Santa Clara Women's Club, Jocelyn Mel, Carlitos Women's Club, and Ann Cochran. I saw that you're on here. I'm really pleased to see you from West Valley Federated Women's Club. You guys are doing a great job. I really appreciate it. Let's keep going. Next district, Marina. Yay, Marina. <laughs> Member level, Betty Robertson and Mary Alexandra Cook, both reached their member level with 16 books and four different categories. You know, the whole purpose of ESO is to expand our knowledge. That's why we separate into categories so that we can read outside our comfort zone. Anita DiNicola has reached star levels, 40 books, 10 categories. Now that's really reaching out. And that just makes you a better person all the way around. Let's keep going. Next, we go to Mount Diablo, which is, there we go, Sherry Meyer, 11 centuries. My gosh, 1,100 books. <sighs> Tinka, you'll be there soon. I know you will. Tracy Woman's Club. Sherry Meyer, you, do on, you are doing an amazing job. Now let's go on to Orange District. Orange District has been busy as well. Marsha Willett, completion of member level for your Belinda Women's Club. Good job. And Kathy McGraw, four centuries. Four. I'm sure she's probably almost done with five by now. And by the time I get them, I think people are almost to the next level because they just keep on going. All right, let's move on. We have a special award going on here. San Bernardino District. Look at this. Beulah Achiever, Century 24 and 25. That's a lot of reading. And I understand she's pretty darn close to getting 26. So that's two diamonds and a half. A diamond. Um, really puts you up there. Women's Club of San Bernardino, Beulah, you are doing a great job. Wow, that's amazing. All right, put on your tiara and keep on reading. Let's go to the next district. San Joaquin, Catherine Hollins, I saw you're on this call, excellent. From Fowler Improvement Association, reach member level, 16, 16 books. And Doris Duquette has kept on going with her centuries. She's on century four and probably ready to submit century five by now, uh, celebrating Shafter Women's Club. Great job, Doris. I know you keep everybody reading. Moving on. 
Sierra Kawenga has been really busy. Check this out. The member level, Leisha Baldwin, Mammoth Lakes, Lakes Women's Club. Leisha has also submitted for star level. She just keeps on going. Marsha LaRusso, I know you're on this call. I saw you. And Tina Victory, who's moved away, but she still got recognized for her contributions to Palmdale Women's Club. And Barb White is on her century two, probably almost done with three by now. Great job keeping everybody motivated. It's much appreciated. Sierra Coenga, you're doing a great job. Keep going. Let's see who's next. Southern District. Hey, Karen Reed. Yay. San Diego Women's Club reached her member level and started a new book club for which I'm really excited. How did it go last night? I'm sure it went great. Let's move on. Sutter District. Sutter District, Shelby Gord, Women's Improvement Club of Roseville has reached her star level, 40 books, 40 books, 10 different categories. She's just bursting with knowledge. I love it. What an improvement and what a contribution to the women's clubs in general. All right, let's move on to Tierra Adorada. Tierra Adorada has been especially busy Member level, Mary Harrison. I've been trying to get Mary to submit book reports for 10 years. She finally did it. I'm so proud of her. Janet Flickinger and Terry Boosie also made it to member level. They just keep on going. Two of our members have reached star level, Ariel Cottrell and Cosima Van Buskirk. Notice all these women are from San Buenaventura Women's Club. That's my club. So you can tell that I'm in there pushing for her, uh, for all of them to get their reports in. Let's go to the next slide. We continue to have an amazing amount of progress going on. I've reached century two, finished one and two. Uh, Patricia DeZazzo, Julian Newkirk, Ariel Rose, Jancy Sauer and Vanessa Otto, all from Soma's Thursday Club, which meets monthly um, just to talk about books in addition to their regular meeting. Look at that. Patricia's got Century 2, June's got Century 3, Ariel did 4 and 5, Jancy did 5, and Vanessa has finished up 8 centuries. I'm sure she's pretty close to being done with 9 by now. So, <clears throat> woohoo! That's a lot of achievements, ladies. Last slide. In this last year, in one year, and now I can't say it's just because we're all sitting around at home. I think you would have been reading all this anyway, um, pretty sure. But now that you have time to actually report, it makes a difference. 42 level achievements have been recognized. Um, for this last year, and I just think that's fantastic. I know that you will continue, and for 21-22, we're going to have probably double that. So keep on using those new forms, the simplified forms, and get those reports into me. Congratulations, everybody. You've been doing a great job. And that's it for the awards. Thank you, Sonia, for doing that for me. And I believe that we are ready to move into our speaker. I'm very excited about this speaker. I actually heard her give a presentation to uh, Yolo County Libraries, and I was so taken with her. Uh, first of all, her name's Shirley, so, you know, sisterhood right there. Shirley Descartes, let me tell you just a little bit about her. She's an author of the historical fiction book, Heartwood, which I happen to have oh, come on, my little stickies all over the front here. Heartwood, for women, for the earth, for the future. This 
novel is really interesting. It interweaves the lives of three California family women from the past, the present, and the future. It was inspired by her great grandmother, Emily Hoppen, who in 1915 won a heated competition campaign for president of California Federated Women's Clubs. If you have the, the new yearbook from CFWC, you'll see her picture in there. Shirley is a fourth generation Californian who grew up near Sacramento and received a BS in nursing at UC Medical Center in San Francisco. Much like her great grandmother, Shirley has worked to better the conditions of women, children, and the communities in which they live. She's now retired and lives with her husband on a small Sierra homestead they built in the 1970s. She is the senior editor of the Camptonville Courier and an avid gardener and naturalist. This is exciting. The book Heartwood, For Women, For the Earth, for the future has recently been named a finalist for the 2020 Eric Hoffer Montagna Award, awarded to the most thought provoking books that either illuminate, progress or redirect thought. And I can tell you having just finished the book that it did all those things for me. So I am very pleased to introduce you to Shirley Descartes author of Heartwood. Now I just have to figure out how to get into my program here. Just give me a second. Okay. Um, just a minute. Uh, <laughs> this is where we were. Now I want to go the other direction. Um, I need to get to my speaker view. Okay, Sonia. <laughs> I'm screen sharing. Hey, technology, um, huh? Hi, hon. Yeah, you I can uh, just stop yeah, go back out and go back in and you should be fine. Yeah. Um, someone asked about where to send information that they want to put in publications. Uh, while she's looking for that, it's a good time to do that. It's CFWC communications with plural at gmail.com and we will help you get the word out if you're having a special speaker and then we'll also um uh, put out great books we love doing that kind of thing shirley's a big help with that so uh, we'll let me check with shirley super fast to see if she's ready shirley okay. how's it going you want to try one more time no, i'm just about there just about there okay huh? yeah can you see my screen yes i don't i don't see, see you, you. You see me? See but you. You see me. Okay, now I got to share screen. Okay, I think I, I hopefully this will get it. We got it. Yes. You, you see yeah. Me? And you can see the screen, the big yeah, screen. It, says, it does. It says slides one of twenty five. But no, I want the. Um, you should be able to see just the big screen and not my. No, there's a place for speaker notes. That's not the view. Okay, I need to see. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. What I need to do is get back to the presenter view, and that's what I'm not finding. Um, hold on. This, this is okay. This is where I want to start. Uh, Shirley, do you want us to give you a minute, and then uh, we can yeah. just okay. All right. We're gonna we're gonna mute you and let you find that, and then you just give me a okay. thumbs up when you're ready. And okay. maybe Shirley has something else she wants to talk about. Yes, I do actually. Um, I just want to remind everybody, as Sonia mentioned, the chat is for Q&A, and I believe that our speaker would like to have field the questions at the end rather than intermittently. So if you would please type your questions into the chat, then um, we'll monitor those and pull those up at the end. All right. I actually have one of my newer team members working the chat. If you all have not met Linda Queen, she is our web chairman, Good. website chairman, and she is fantastic. You will really enjoy getting to know her. She is going to be taking care of the chat for us today. Linda, are there any questions right now that we could field while we're doing this? Um, no, there's not. I just put in the chat the email address that you just 
um, gave us the CFWC communications at Gmail for club ESL members or clubs to send photographs or requests or other information to you. Thank you, Linda. Everyone, this is Linda Queen. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Okay, it looks like Shirley's ready. You're going to need to unmute, Shirley. This is what happens. You practice over and over again, and then when it actually comes, okay. Um, do you see my Do you see my speaker notes, or do you see the screen? You see the speaker notes. I don't want you to see the speaker notes. But however, just a few seconds ago, it was full screen, and it was the PowerPoint. Like that, but see now I can't see my speaker notes, which is interesting because there should be on the top. There should be. Uh, okay. Would you okay. like us to give you another minute? I'm sure Shirley yeah. has more housekeeping. <laughs> okay, okay, give me one more minute. And if not, then okay. I'll just do it by- Just let us know. Let us know when you're ready. It's all good, hon. Okay, go Shirley. Okay, well, while we're waiting, if anybody has any quick questions about any of the ESO materials, now would be a good time to ask them. Um, I'm sure everyone by now is familiar with the fact that all the materials are available on the CFWC website. There is actually a tab for ESO. Your submission forms are there. Your brochure is there to print out and pass along to interested people. I was uh, suggesting if those clubs who have a, a little free library or a bookmobile or a book desk or a, whatever you have to trade books that outside of the club be sure and put a membership application in the book Oop, black screen that's a black screen now, i actually see the powerpoint can i get a hands up if everyone else can see the powerpoint okay so it's not just me okay fantastic so it looks like everyone can see your powerpoint now surely Thank okay. you, everyone. I appreciate your help. And then the question is, do you, but you don't see my speaker notes, right? No. Uh -uh. Okay. I, I think we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say that I'm relatively new to Zoom technology, so bear with me if I hit the wrong button or something, but I always come back, okay? Um, but I wanted to start out with thanking the California Federation of Women's Clubs, the ESO, um, in particular for inviting me back to this year's virtual convention um, to share my novel and also the life of my great grandmother, Emily Hoppen. Um, I've been looking forward to sharing this since um, the, the uh, Federation cancel, had to cancel last year's convention due to COVID. But I'm excited now to share Hartwood because the Federation's early history, as, as the other Shirley said, plays such a prominent part in the story and I've been really wanting to tell you and share that part with you. And also the decades of research that I've done um, about my grandmother, great grandmother as she evolved from a farm woman to the Federation president in 1915. And I'm dying to see your record. So someday I'll have to connect with somebody there. I also wanna thank the Camptonville Historical Society because I'm using their history room in the Camptonville Community Center um, the, that's one thing about living in the mountains, the internet is not very good. So um, you live in a mountain canyon. So anyway, I'm here, the internet should be good and I think we're ready to go. So let me try this next slide. Okay, now you just see the slide, right? Not my speaker notes? Okay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it was like technology. Okay, let me introduce you to my great grandmother, Emily Hoppen. Um, I have four photographs of her and this is one from her middle years. Now, when I was growing up, my grandmother loved to tell stories about her mother, Emily, who were, and how she ran a large farm single-handedly, how she took on saloons during prohibition, and also that she was known as a woman of principles. Back in the 1980s, with the rise of feminism and women growing into power, my great-grandmother became sort of a feminist legend, sort of the family matriarch in our family. And you know the question, if there's one person you can go back into history and talk to, who would it be? Hands down for me, it would be my great grandmother. This is my grandma dot dot. This is Emily Hoppen's youngest daughter, Dorothea. And she is reading one of the first Ms. magazines 
when it came out in the 1970s. <laughs> and you can see Bette Midler's on the cover. I think Bette Midler is still going strong, right? But she was fascinated with what women were doing nowadays. But Grandma Dada was also a great storyteller and she made her mother larger than life. Well, when I was growing up, the Emily that I got to know was that she was a farm woman, a prohibitionist and a club woman. Well, I wasn't sure what a club woman was, uh, but I knew my mother belonged to a bridge club and a dancing club. So I figured it was probably something like that. Huge understatement. So in 1976, when grandma was 81 years old, I sat down with a tape recorder and interviewed grandma so we would not lose her stories. I transcribed them into an oral history book called The Home Place, and uh, you'll see a slide of this, but I just, you know, it's just a little simple bound book of her oral history. And um, it's now posted on my website. So if anybody likes kind of the Foxfire storytelling, um, there's a lot, every page is on my website, shirleydecard.com. Well, because of my interest in her, I was also given Emily's personal scrapbook, which, oh my goodness, was a gold mine of her speeches and papers and newspaper clippings about her campaign for the Federation presidency. Now, it was a very unusual campaign, which you'll find out. And it could have all been lost to history if I hadn't discovered this scrapbook. And um, anyway, after, the, after I continued my casual research for Emily Hoppen for a couple of 20 years almost, I decided that I had all this information and I really should write up the story of her life. Well, the question is, how did Emily become Eliza in a novel? When I started to write her biography, it seemed to me at the time that I really didn't have enough to create a book of general interest. However, you know, she did live at a very important time for women with uh, women's suffrage and prohibition and so forth. So I began asking, well, what's the larger context of Emily's life? How does her life then and her work relate to us today? So next I decided I would write a book contrasting her life with mine because we're both, we both live close to the land and we are both concerned with social issues. Well, everything changed one night about three in the morning. I was visited by the future when an apparition of my great granddaughter stood at the foot of my bed. And she said, her name is Amisha. And that if I write about the past and the, and the present, that I have to write about the future because everything that happened back then, everything that we're doing today is creating the world that she is living in. And she was asking for help. So <laughs> I woke up and I had like a totally different take on what I was going to do. And Hartwood evolved into the legacy of an ancient woman, Shema'a, who saw the earth's demise at the hands of man and sent her a warning and a message of hope forward in time within the heart of an acorn. I interwove the stories of the three family women from the past, present, and future who are mysteriously connected by the old family desk they inherit. Now, each woman deals with the issues of her time, and sometimes they even cross over space and time to help each other out. And that's kind of the fun of magical realism and the fun of fiction, of course. So you can read on the screen, we've got Eliza, the post gold rush, Harmony, who's the present uh, character, back to the land homestead in the Sierras, a little bit like myself, and Amisha lived in the dystopic San Francisco and the Sierra Nevadas. Also, one of the recurring images in Hartwood is the family disc, which I used as a metaphor. In fact, uh, the original or the working title of my book was called The Disc because it played such a central, it was a, it was a central character throughout the whole story. Um, and it represents what connects us to a deeper intuitive more universal earth-based wisdom. So again, we, just to recap briefly, Shema'a is the ancient woman who found a way to send her message forward in time within the heart of an acorn. Then Eliza in the past built a small desk from her beloved grandmother Oak. 
and that had a mysterious influence on her. When she sat at the desk, she knew what must be done. Then we have Harmony, the present back to the lander, who was really obsessed with saving the earth. She didn't ask for the desk, she didn't want it, and when it showed up, she ignored it until she couldn't any longer. And then we have Amisha on the edge of California's collapse. She fled a dystopic San Francisco in search of the family homestead and whispers of an old desk. She almost gave up her life to find it, but in the end, it made all the difference in the world as she created a new way of living. And by the way, that desk sitting underneath the tree, that is my real family desk. It exists, maybe not that far back, but generations. So let me start by telling you a little bit more about the Emily Hoppen I've come to know based on my years of historical research. So even though I started with just the facts of her life, after nearly 10, 20 years of living in her skin, I really got a sense of what she cared about and how she thought and how she made decisions and the tremendous amount of focus and energy she had. So I took all that and wove it into the fictional version of her life. And historical fiction, which you probably know, is factual history embellished with imagination. First, the facts. Okay, I started with the family sources. Um, I did some research. I had my great grandfather, Charles Hoppins letters home from the gold rush. I had the home place, which I showed you, the Dorothy's memories of her mother and growing up on the Yellow Ranch. And then I had Emily's personal scrapbook. I also did a lot of internet research, mainly Google searches and digital newspaper collection. And as you can imagine, back in the 1990s, there was hardly anything on the internet. And as compared to now, it's like, now there's an explosion of digital information. <clears throat> the last time I checked on Emily Hoppen Yolo, there were 200, 240 references to her. It was just like mind boggling. I couldn't get to them all. The, the um, document on the right I found on the internet, and it's probably my very favorite um, interview with her. And it's on, all of these are on my website, shirleydecard.com. I also made site visits. Um, I visited the Yola County archives. Um, they now hold copies of all my research. And then on the bottom left is Deborah Bushnell from the Federation. Uh, she was a state chair of the Women's History and Research Center in 2019. And she was sort of in my area and we've been communicating. And so she came and she did the original handheld scanning of this, of this very fragile scrapbook. And we did it in one of the historical libraries in Nevada City. And it was a godsend because then I could read the digital versions and not have to flip through the fragile pages. And then since then, the YOLO archives has their professional large size scanner and they've gone through and they've done the whole scrapbook and they will have that on their website. It's too big for mine. On the far right is the Gibson House Historical Museum in Woodland. And I took photographs of all the rooms for my settings. And then whenever I got a chance while traveling, I also did research. In the middle, you can see the historic record rooms in Nevada, Winnemucca, where I filled in some mysterious gaps in her story. And I can still smell those old ledgers. They were wonderful, the little scrolly handwriting. And then the bottom is the California Interpretive Center in Elko, Nevada. If you're the kind of person who loves stories about the Im immigrants traveling to California during the gold rush and the wagon trains and all that, this is the place to go. I've been there several times and it just immerses you in that experience. It's not a museum, it's an interpretive center. So highly recommended. My dream now, of course, is to find Emily's personal letters or journals. So if anybody's a historical sleuth, I'll put you on that, that trail. A little bit about Emily's background. Um, her early years, she was born in 1854 in Niles, Michigan to well-educated parents. Her father, Nathaniel Bacon, was a judge of the Michigan Supreme Court. Her mother was Carolyn Lord Bacon, always um, well-traveled, read, and a friend to those in need. Emily had an extensive four-year classical education at the Michigan Female Seminary in Kalamazoo. And in the middle, you can't read it, but I just to show you, she had a, a very broad, extensive classical education. Um, languages, history, literature, poetic works, rhetoric, composition, mathematics, science, you name it. Later in 1915, the San Francisco Chronicle described Emily as one of the most brilliant women in the state, able to talk about any subject that may be presented. 
So one of the family stories that I love to tell is when Emily was just an infant, the Bacon family was visited by an old family friend, Charles Hoppen, who had immigrated to California during the gold rush 20 years before. When this 27 year old man held baby Emily, he said to her parents, I'm gonna wait for her. And that's exactly what he did. 20 years later, he came back from California and asked her to marry him. She was 20, he was 47. And you'll find that story tucked into Hartwood. So in 1874, she married and left everything for California. Now, those are the facts, you'll find those in the biographies. But really, I would love to know her thinking about leaving everything she knew to go to California with an older man she hardly knew. She must have really wanted to get to California. So I wrote a fictionalized version of her life and got to imagine all those. So there's not much recorded in the early years, um, 1874 to 1895. She had five children. So I imagine most of her life, like all of us women even today, with young children, your life revolves around your children and their schools and maybe parks and you know things like that. Um, but from her um, oral history book, my oral history book, this one, um, I was able to put together her daily routine. And I'm not gonna read all of these, but um, she, had a, she was very organized and she would get up at five in the morning. And one of the interesting things is she sold her butter to the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. So she had to get her butter and fryers on the 6 a.m. train from Woodland to San Francisco. And then her day started. She did her bread making and her biscuit making and everything. And then she had breakfast by herself and she served her guests. They're always guests and then you know cleaning and so forth. One of my favorite moments in her life is 1.30 in the afternoon to five when she worked at her desk. Now, I really like that she carved out the largest part of her day for writing. And I know she also did a lot of reading in there because she was an avid reader, which you will find out. This is what her scrapbook looks like, and it shows a progression. Um, so it, it starts out with um, most of it is poetry and prose in the beginning, about the first third. It's about children and motherhood and nature and death, kind of romantic sentiment stuff. But then you get this hint um, on this picture on the right hand side, there's Dolores Spencer, secretary of the California WCTU in the middle, a prohibition worker. So you know something's going on. The last two thirds are filled with pages about the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the, the Federation, the obituaries, and long printouts of all of her, most of her speeches and papers. And most of them were laced with poetry and quotation. She was a very eloquent lyrical speaker. Now, Emily fought for prohibition and helped form the Yolo County WCTU and was president for three years. Now, here's an interesting thing. Turn of the century, Wooden had a population of 3,000 people. Guess how many saloons it had? There were 40 saloons for 3,000 people. And on one street alone, there was 20 bars, 20 saloons lining the street. So imagine a town of 3,000 people, it's pretty small, but imagine that there are 40 Starbucks in it. You kind of get the idea of what it was like pre-prohibition. And it was part of the problem for women was it's where politics were decided. They couldn't vote anyway, but the men would make their decision in the saloon fueled by alcohol the night before and then go and vote. And they would buy and sell their votes to each other. So while the men drank their earnings, the women returned, they returned home to the women to inflict oftentimes immense physical and emotional abuse on their wives and children. So even though Emily was against alcohol, she cared also about the principle of honesty. And one of my favorite stories um, in the oral history is when the farmhands came to her and they said that they complained that Vernie down at the bar was shortchanging them at the saloon. So Emily set up a plan and she said that 
what, at least one of the men is going to have to stay sober, kind of like be the DD, I guess, and watch carefully what was going on, take notes, and then report back to her the next day. Well, after she found out that they were giving $20 gold pieces and getting change for a $1 gold piece, Emily stormed down to the saloon and told Vernie that she was wise to the fact that she was shortchanging the men. And if she heard another complaint, she'd see to it that she was out of business. She wasn't going to have her men cheated out of their wages. And so I, I'm going to read something from um, the oral history, but it's these, one of the main saloon owners, old John Huckey from the Bucket of Blood Saloon. He came to her memorial. He came to her funeral. And my grandma was very incensed that her nemesis would come to her funeral. But he said, you know, that's the trouble with the world today. No people with principles. Those old ladies had principles. Listen, when I did something wrong, I knew she'd come. And when her horse was out in front of my saloon, everyone in town knew I was in trouble. She could rally all the old timers, the people who had settled there in the early community. She could unite the temperance people and the farming people, and you just didn't have a prayer. So she was what the, the town called the three, they had three women and they called them the three musketeers who banded together. There were Mrs. Lawhead, who was the vice principal of Whittle and High, Mrs. Houston, who published the Home Alliance, and then Emily Hoppen. And they must have been a very formidable group. So as history goes, once women got the right to vote in 1911, guess what happened? <laughs> Things really changed. With 400 new voters in Woodland, they, the women voted unanimously to close down all the saloons. So it's no wonder the men didn't want women to have the franchise, right? Our husband Charles died in 1903 when Emily was 49 years old. And because he was 27 years older than Emily, they knew he would probably go first. So ahead of time, they decided that she was not going to be a helpless widow. She would learn to run the farm herself. So the next year she was in training with him and he taught her everything she needed to know about running an 800 acre farm. After his death, she blossomed, which is not unusual, into community work. She did prohibition, the Federation, Women's Federation, board president of the Rochdale Company, as well as running a highly successful farm, and traveling around the state, giving speeches. Emily was very passionate about country life and especially about getting women into farming, which is interesting. You wouldn't think of that back turn of the century. She wrote many papers and speeches for the California Fruit Growers Association and the Woodland Farmers Institute, often detailing how women could start up their own farms, even invited women to come and live with her to learn more. So here's a sample of the speeches that I have posted on my website under historical research. She wrote The Country of Life, Literature of the Farm, which I'll get back to, Can Women Succeed in Horticulture, Women as Farmers, Diversified Farmers, Farming, 25 Acres Enough, and The Farm That Pays. But now all of those speeches had lyrical elements to them, um, which is very unusual if you imagine a bunch of mainly men reading or listening to her speeches. But here's a sample of what she wrote to the, or she, what she, a speech that she gave to the State Fruit Growers Association. She was talking about farming, et cetera, et cetera. Then she went on to say, there will always be in my mind the picture of those beautiful mornings when the earth was just awakening from her night's sleep, when the clouds lay in long white bars across her breast, when in the distance the snowy sierras showed white and crimson and gold, as the rays of the morning sun touched their summits, they were mornings to remember. So on the left, she was asked to give the opening address, you know, the opening, that's a big deal, um, to the Fruit Growers Association in, in 1914. And I don't know if they asked for this speech, but what she gave was called the literature of the farm. And it was so immensely popular that they printed it verbatim in a newsletter. And I'm gonna give you a sample of what she told the farmers about reading. This is what she said. Now, the, the, I'm going to show you the pictures on the bottom. Those are all her books 
that my cousin Jim Moffat and I inherited. And there are, most of them are autographed by her and so forth. So it's my, one of my treasured possessions. Okay, so this is what Emily told the farmers about reading. And I think you women will totally appreciate this, right? Every home needs some books in sight, just as sometimes we need our friends in sight. Two books should be the nucleus for the farm library, Shakespeare and the Bible. And she said, have it be a small book that you can carry around with you. And then she listed the other ones. Have at least one good magazine devoted to synopsis of current events, as well as a farm paper, a city paper, and your town paper. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Prefix the words, as a man readeth in his newspaper, so thinketh he. Try to find a daily paper, if you can, that devotes two thirds to good things and one third to bad. Do not be afraid to show hospitality to new ideas. Remember that the radical of today is a conservative of tomorrow. And remember also that books like friends can stand a good light. The open fire in the winter, the piazza in the summer, and in the evening, a clear shaded lamp. I love that speech. <laughs> So further in her scrapbook, we start to see clippings of the California Federation of Women's Clubs. And you all know this, of course, but this is what I would share with the general public, that the Federation was organized in 1900. And since women couldn't vote in California until 1911 and nationwide till 1920, the Federation was one of the few places that women had power, especially collective power, to make the world a better place. So these pages were written actually by Deborah Bushnell from the Federation for the four pages of my book to introduce readers to the Federation. So um, on the right hand side, she wrote, I was struck by the similar similarities of women in Hartwood with all the women involved with the California Federation of Women's Club from the beginning. Women like Emily Hoppen, they were, they were and are the backbone of every part of our lives, be it home, business, social or political. In the early days, women were considered second-class citizens, but Emily rose above the norm of her day and was a shining star. Thank you, Deborah. One of the strengths of the Federation, I think, is that it focuses on the collective power of women working together. And that's part of the message in my book. So from her scrapbook, from Emily's scrapbook, I found this list of resolutions that were passed at the General Federation in 1912 and thought it'd be interesting to compare with today's programs. So I found this on the right from your website and it's really, it's too detailed to read here, but I can I'd be happy to send the slide to, um, or the article to anybody that would like it. But you can see just kind of glancing back and forth that the issues and the programs and the resolutions are all very similar. Um, you guys are just all really right on track and um, have been consistent from the beginning. I admire greatly. Okay, 1915 started a new chapter in Emily's life. And without, again, without her scrapbook, this might have been lost. So it's kind of fun to, um, to, to be able to understand that this is quite an unusual election. Be, um, so I was able to create a historical version of this election uh, for presidency all the way to the end. Um, I was, I try to be pretty true to the facts, but of course it's fictionalized. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote, I quote, never in the history of club women's elections was there such a contest as was waged today by Mrs. Jones of Oroville and Mrs. Emily Hoppen of Yolo for the state presidency. Now elections are held as today, I guess, every two years, and they alternate between the North and the Southern clubs. So the Northern Club nominated their outgoing president, as they usually do, Mrs. Jones of Oroville, the traditional candidate. But another faction in the North, and I think it was the Shakespeare Club of Woodland, unexpectedly added an alternate candidate, Mrs. Hoppen, to represent the country women. Now, I don't know why. Um, and again, any historical sleuths out there want to help me discover this might have had something to do with her position and prohibition. I'm not really sure, but they loved mainly that she was, she represented the, the country women. So this was um, 
I'm going to read you another quote from the newspaper. And it kind of describes the context of this election, how different it was from the normal elections before and probably after. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote this. Just what will happen when Greek meets Greek? In other words, when the Jones faction meets the Hoppen faction at the state convention of the Federated California, Women, California Club Women this week, it's impossible to conjecture. But it certainly promises to be the fiercest clash in the Federation's history. The hundreds supporting Mrs. Jones have no intention of yielding an inch, nor have the enthusiastic admirers of Mrs. Hoppen shown any signs of eliminating themselves. As a consequence, the only means of capturing the presidency is by storm. And in storming, it is predicted that friendships and feelings are to be bruised, while at the same time, that general harmony aimed at as the basic idea of the Federation is surely going to be punctured. Calm arbitration at this late date is apparently impossible, and the atmosphere is blue with a wave of expectant irritation. Well, <laughs> um, the newspapers loved Emily and she was well loved up and down the state because she had been a figure in the Federation for a long time, um, very, holding various offices, including vice president. Um, they described her as an elder, she was 60 years old, eloquent, articulate, charismatic, organized, capacity to do a lot of things well at one time, visionary, brilliant, and kind, and she represented the countrywoman. So I would like to read a short fictionalized section in Hartwood where Eliza made an extemporaneous speech at the convention. So from my book. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, this is fictionalized, but it kind of captures a lot of what I was trying to say. So she's talking to the women at the, at the convention. As women, we know that everything we do or don't do has an impact that accumulates over time, like the sun that wrinkles our skin. Can you imagine that there will be a time without water, or I dare say, without children? Straightening to her full five feet three inches, Eliza walked slowly down the front row, looking each woman in the eye. Our California Federation was founded upon the principle that strength united is stronger. I ask you to come one step further with me. We are foremost an organization of women. And with the recent franchise gained here in California and the power of our collective vote, we now have the clout to change the way we live in California. The future to which we are headed may be dry as a desert, but this doesn't have to be. Just as we encircle our homes and children to protect them, we will band together and fiercely protect the future of our home on this earth not for the next election, nor even the next decade, but for our great, great, great grandchildren. Well, in what was a huge upset, Emily won the presidency. Then wasting no time, she immediately got to work. It was mid-May and she must've been so energized because she finally had the power to do everything that she wanted to do, but to put her vision into action. And she worked tirelessly, which unfortunately was to be her undoing. So here's the Overland Monthly, that article I talked about earlier. Um, it, they ran a four page interview with her and it really gives a personal glimpse into her philosophy and her passion and so forth. And it's posted, like I said, on my website, shirleyricard.com. Now I pulled a few excerpts out of it, uh, not for you to read because it's kind of small, but just to know that she had a stance on the country woman's viewpoint on water is the fountainhead of California's prosperity, even back then, and peace, which she feels must largely be women's work. Totally agree with her on that. So one of the conundrums I faced in writing Emily into this eco-speculative novel was that all the women in Hartwood were dealing with environmental issues of their time, you know, like deforestation and drought and wildfires and proposed dams and severe decline in fertility and children's health and so forth. Up to that point, I knew Emily mainly as a farm woman a prohibitionist in a club room. And I thought, well, it's fiction. I can write her in um, any way I need as an environmentalist. And then as you can see from this slide, it turns out I really didn't have to because she was very concerned with um, 
the natural resources. And she even supported John Muir's plea to, to the Federation to stop the proposed Hetch Hetchy Dam in Yosemite. Well, this article also details her plans on how much she wanted to get done. So six weeks after being elected, she held her first board meeting in San Francisco on July 30. Sadly, it was also to be her last. On the train home to Woodland, Emily started feeling ill. Dorothy and the family met her at the station and knowing something was wrong, they quickly whisked her home. When I interviewed my grandma Dot Dot, she described these next few days in great detail. She said it felt as real as if it had happened yesterday. And in Hartwood, I tried to be true to the events that followed. Once they got Emily home and in bed, they called for the doctor who quickly arrived and said that Emily was suffering from sheer exhaustion and she had a hard time breathing. So he put her on strict bed rest, not allowed to write and couldn't even dictate to her club women which frustrated her to no end. And she wouldn't let Dorothy tell the family that she was sick. So I think she thought she was gonna get better. But on the third day, against her wishes, she was taken in a horse-drawn ambulance to the hospital in Woodland. And that was a two hour trip in the summer heat. However, in, in Hartwood, I let her die at home because I knew that's what she really wanted. So this, this is what I wrote in Hartwood, and this is uh, Emily speaking, or Eliza. She said, is it, if this is death, then this is where I shall remain, she whispered to Dorothea, where you took your first breath and Silas his last. I will be among my women. On the fourth day, August 4th, she died of heart failure caused by exhaustion. Now, my developmental editor said when she, she teared up when she read this chapter, she said, even though she knew what was going to happen, she said, it just, she just loved Emily so much. Well, and all the newspapers all over the state loved Emily. And from San Diego all the way up to the northern border and even into Oregon, they spread the news about her passing. And Dorothy uh, pasted all the obituaries into her scrapbook. So that's how I have them. And um, they were all very saddened at losing their beloved Emily and a leader of thought in California. And so in closing, I'm going to read one last little section from Hartwood. And this is, um, this is at her funeral. And I, what I have is I have all three women together, Eliza, Harmony, and Amisha. They're kind of off stage, you know, talking among themselves, kind of looking down at the, at the funeral. Eliza Baxter never believed in rumors that the dead hung around the living for three days, occasionally attending their own funeral. Yep, here she was, inspecting every detail from afar with detached scrutiny. Why, it didn't feel the least bit like haunting. And my house is such a mess. Mrs. Archer doesn't clean until next week, she moaned. Bad timing, timing said Harmony, and you with all your silver unpolished. Well, maybe you should have followed your instinct and polished them yourself, Amisha shook her head. We all think we'll have more time, but then sometimes, poof, you're gone. For the next 24 hours, a steady stream of women sat with Eliza's body, laid to rest in the dining room table. As requested, Eliza still wore the unadorned beige linen dress and her favorite green apron. Well, my dear grandmother, newspapers wrote about you for months. Dottie must have clipped out the articles and pasted them into your scrapbook. It's my most treasured possession, said Harmony. You still have it, Eliza said. Even when, even I got to peek at, at it, uh, Amisha said, well, I never imagined. Every word you wrote, every speech you spoke, Harmony laughed. The reporter from the Home Alliance wrote that you died in the harness. Well, that's an image if I ever saw one, beaten to death like an old workhorse. Eliza viewed the mourners descending from the automobile at the farmhouse carriage entrance. How could I die when I was getting to the most important work of my life? It must have been a mistake. I don't know. Are there mistakes? Amisha turned to Harmony. Harmony shrugged, and the three women settled into a prolonged silence. At last, Amisha spoke. You saw her, of course. Eliza didn't reply. The old woman who placed the acorn there beneath your hands. See how Dottie lifted and reset your hands just now? I don't believe Dottie saw it, Harmony said. No, she couldn't have. 
Well, I've seen that woman before, Eliza said, as if unraveling a dream. We all have. So the woman, of course, was Shema'a. Um, from the... So fiction, I have found, has the power to convey an emotional truth, enabling readers to hear on an emotional level in a way that plain facts, like biographies, cannot. And I often wonder what my great-grandmother would think of this book, of hearing her words echoed a hundred years into the future, as relevant today as they were when she spoke them. We often never really know the impact of what we do, yet we do it regardless, because we know it's the right thing to do. So Hartwood begins and ends with the words that Shema'a sent forward to the women of the future. Listen to the silence, hold the earth in your hands, gather the women, then do what must be done. Thank you. I want, to, I want to thank the Federation again for this opportunity to, for me to come full circle and share my book and my research and Emily Hoffman I've come to know and um, everything, most everything you've seen is on my website, um, including the 30 documents of your speeches and it's all under historical research if you want to learn more. And I also have a blog um, on my website, shirleydecard.com, and I write about the topics in the book, both past, present and future. Um, so you can sign up to follow my blog on my website. And um, Thank you very much, Shirley. Are you going to be taking questions? Yes, yes. Okay, how about if we do that? Linda, do you have any questions in your area? Yes, there is a question from Colleen Jansen. She asks, what pressure, Shirley, do you feel to live up to the reputation of Emily? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't, I don't, um, because she was a very unique person. And I, I feel like there's a lot of parallels and I, um, to our lives, but you know, I do my life in my way and I'm certainly not the, the big public fe fe uh, speaker that she is and public fi figure that she is. But I think, I think we all do things in our own way. And, and I, so writing is my way, my writing this book in particular. Um, but I also work out in the community. I, I just don't feel like I'm as big a person as she. That's, that's an interesting question. Right. Thank you, Linda. Um, we do have one hand raised. Peggy, do you have any hands that you'd like to acknowledge? Peggy. Okay, so I'll go ahead. We have Nancy. Nancy, you have a question? Sorry, no, you're, I'm, I'm sorry, hon, your your hand is up. And we wanted to acknowledge that your hand was up, Nancy. Thank you, hon. All right, so it, the floor is open to all questions for our speaker. If you will ask the questions, Peggy will acknowledge you with your name. And then Linda will let us know if there's anything else in the chat. Shirley, Sonia, I do have another question. Great, fantastic. This, um, this question is from Vina to Shirley. How did you find time to do so much research and then write this book when you were working as a nurse? <laughs> yeah, well, actually I started this more as I was, as I was starting to retire, but I worked, that's why it took me 10 years to write the book and 20 years doing research. It started just as kind of a hobby at first, the research, just because I wanted to know more about my great grandmother. And then when it started formulating into a book, it took me almost 10 years to pull it together. So I wasn't working full time on it until about the last uh, two years. And then I actually started working with an editor that um, helped me move along faster than I was going on my own. But I think, I, I know people that work and write and I'm, my hat's off to them. I, I was mainly retired. Okay, we have Sherry Meyer with a question. Yes, thank you. Um, if we could just go back, the history to me is very fascinating. This 1915 election, do you know after she died, 
how they replaced her. Did it uh, go as it should have to the first vice president? And do you know the name of that woman? Yes, it was uh, Mrs. Knight um, was, the, was the vice president. And on one of the slides, um, there was a picture of her. She stepped right up um, and assumed the role of, of a spokesperson, excuse me, and then president. And it was very seamless. And she said that she was impressed that Emily had everything so organized as if she almost knew that um, she may be handing um, the, the reins over. So nice. So I'd, I'd be curious actually what the um, Federation's records show because it may be because she was only the president for two months maybe before she died. So I'm wondering if she even made it to the books. Well, I guess you said somebody said that they, she was. I'd she love to say yes. Yeah. You know, but, a photo because she had she did serve. Did this <laughs> Mrs. Knight kind of carry on her her agenda until she had had time to make her own agenda? I know she started saying she was going to carry on Emily's uh, work and her goals. And it's in the scrapbook in probably if you go on my website um, underneath obituaries, I think I have the, um, the page from her scrapbook that has a picture of Mrs. McKnight and also <clears throat> a couple of pages that, that they wrote in their um, um, newsletter. And um, there should be her address to the Federation, to the women of the Federation in part about losing Emily and then in part about going forward. And if not, um, you can um, email me and on this, on this slide here, it's heartwoodnovel at gmail.com and I'll be sure to answer any other questions um, or do further research for you. But I Thank imagine Mrs. Mrs. Knight probably eventually carried on her own um, Yeah, usually. Yeah. And by the way, since I, I was going to say this, um, here's a picture. This is Shirley's idea. I love this. For those of you who buy the book, um, usually at, at a convention, I'm sitting there writing, you know, um, autographing. And because of this virtual nature, I can't. But I have labels that autograph labels that I will, um, if you will email me at heartwoodnovel at gmail.com, I will personally autograph a label for you that you can put inside your book. And then I'll also, I usually have a couple of other inserts that I sort of surprises that I put inside the book um, that I'll also mail you. So I think the instructions are on that slide. Um, and maybe you'll put that up on your Facebook also for um, to remind people if they want. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any hands at the moment. But Shirley, back to you. Shirley, the CFWC Shirley, this oh, is now yes. your floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I, once again, I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. So interesting. Um, I couldn't put the book down personally. Um, I was telling someone else, sometimes when the the content of books goes between different eras it can be very confusing but i found this one to be seamless um and it didn't bother me at all it made total sense and i absolutely loved it thank you i recommend everybody should read it for for so many reasons one of the things that really struck me uh, towards the end when she's talking um, about being in the Federation. She talks about, uh, or you talk about, uh, on each, uh, each department head is connected to two other heads. They form a unit, help each other out and share resources. So on either side of each woman is in turn another triad making each woman and department stronger. You can go on and on creating as many connections as you need. This is as stable as a three-legged stool. And later on, this is how women work. We reach out to each other. We set personal issues aside in order to strengthen the whole. This is women's power. That is such a strong statement and so indicative of how we work in the Federation. Um, it just spoke to me so beautifully. Thank you. 
We have a question from Colleen Jansen. Hi, Shirley. I was wondering if you're working on another novel or have something planned. Oh, boy. It's like after you give birth to a child and somebody says you're going to have another child. Um, and giving it a little bit of time. Um, you know, an interesting thing is I self-published my book because I finished it when I was 74 years old and I didn't want to go through a publishing house. It was going to take, it takes about two years to get your book published to a publisher. I didn't want to wait that long. I wanted to get the book out now. And so to do that, you self-publish, you, you, know, you independently publish. And it was a lot of work. It was a huge learning curve for me because you have to do everything and you have to contract with people and you have to, the design and everything. So I was pretty exhausted by the end of putting this book out, but extremely satisfied because it's the book that I wanted to write and nobody told me otherwise. So I have a couple of ideas. One of the things I'm doing right now is I'm working with my granddaughter. We, we, we meet every week um, by phone and she's working on a novel. So I'm coaching her. And I have another possible book that has to do with um, the letters between um, a, a couple who's 50, 50 year marriage, 50 year anniversary. And they're, they discover their letters from Vietnam when he was in Vietnam and she was in San Francisco in the 1960s. So again, kind of a time travel thing. That, if I write anything, it'll probably be something along that line. But you never know, you never know. Can I, can I just say something about Shirley's comment about the triad? Um, that was, there was, there was a point one night when I was stuck. I didn't know how to show um, how women work together. And I was, I knew I had to write it the next day. That's where I was going. And I needed a visual. I need some kind of a graphic. And so I, I put it out to the universe, which I often do before I went to bed. And long story short, when I woke up, I had it. I had the visual, which was a triangular quilt, the patchwork of a triangular quilt. And in my health leadership um, education, we talked about the triads as being a very stable form of mm -hmm. developing an organization and working together so you don't have a head. And like men, men do the um, structure of everything that women are working with nowadays. A woman's structure would be more like a triangle. And I thought that was perfect because it really, you don't have to think about it too much. You just know that we work by working together and laying aside our differences and helping each other move along and creating this fabric of, of women working together. So thank you, Shirley, for pointing that out. Um, there's a question from Joyce. Have you considered joining a federated club? <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I feel like I should, right? You know, there isn't any around me. And, um, I think Rose Hill is the closest one that I that I saw. Um, um, I'm not. I don't. I don't join. I'm not a joiner, even though I work with women and work with with people. Um, but you know, it's, it's on the back of my mind. You never know. You never know. Thank you. I don't see any more hands or chat questions. So back to you, Shirley. Okay. Well, I would be curious to know how many uh, people have already picked up the book. Uh, just in general, uh, it's not one that I would have found if not for uh, being introduced to the author. So uh, that's one of the hazards of self-publishing. <laughs> as you know, is getting the word out. How do you get it out and where do you get it out to and, and so forth? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a real challenge. And I'm Charlie, saying, what, um, you were going to offer a, a signature of some kind. Did you want to go over that? Yeah, I did. Um, that's this, this is the autograph that I was going to sign and the sticker that um, if you have to email me first, sure, uh, heartwoodnovel at, at gmail.com. And let me know what you want to write on here, your name or whatever. And I will mail it, and also your mailing address so I can stick this in an envelope and mail it to you. And the other, 
request, this is kind of going back to um, how to promote a book for self-published authors. If you write a book, I mean, if you write a review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that's a tremendous help to all independent writers. And so I, um, it would be a great gift to me to write. It can just be a couple of sentences and a star rating, because the more you have, that's like brownie points. It counts in the big world. And um, so anyway, that, that, I would appreciate that if anybody wants to go in that direction. But I'd be happy to send this. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll stick in a couple of other little surprises. Would you mind just going over the email address one more time and I'll put it up on Facebook for us. Okay, and I, I think I also sent you a, uh, something that you can post, but it's uh, Heartwood, H-E-A-R-T-W-O-O-D novel at gmail.com. Thank and you so much. Put in, the, put in the subject line, you know, book autograph or just something, I'll figure it out, but include your, um, your address, your mailing address. We have one more question from Colleen Jansen. Who is your favorite author? Oh, I don't have one favorite author. I love, um, um, of course, my mind's going to go blank now. Um, Barbara Kingsolver. Um, I like, um, uh, oh, she just died. I'm, 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 my, my, my head is like up here, but she just died. She lives in Oregon. She wrote Ursula Le Guin. I like Ursula Le Guin. Um, I love fantasy writers, um, but I also like ones that are kind of grounded, not too like out there. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, my, my head is not, like not on that slot, but those are the, those are the, some of the ones that come to mind. Um, Gary Snyder is, you know, he's, he's, he's not a fiction writer, but he's um, an amazing influential writer about the world we live in. Um, he's, he's one of my very favorite readers, writers. Thank you. And also in the chat, a couple of people have said that they were able to purchase your book as an ebook on Kindle. Right, right. You can go to Amazon and buy it either as a paperback or as a ebook Kindle, definitely. And then you can also get your um, your bookstore, your local bookstore. And I always like to support independent bookstores for obvious reasons. I want them to stick around. I don't want them to go away. Um, so buy your book at the independent bookstore and they probably won't have it, but they can order it for you. And oftentimes within one or two days, you'll get it and you don't have to pay for shipping. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have, we have a question. Marlon, yeah, I was wondering if you had particular training as a researcher in, you know, you inherited a lot of excellent family documents, but then the other additional historical research that you did and also as a writer. Uh, I'm not as a re not as a researcher. Um, that's just my my passion. The well, you know, nursing background gives you a lot of skills. You know, you have to you research the patient's history. You know, there's a lot of things you learn from medical background. But writing is something that I have always done. Even as a nurse, if somebody needed to have something written, they give it to me to write. And I told stories to my my sisters. I was a good storyteller as well. But I took a lot of writing classes and I attended a lot of writing conferences and I belong to writing groups and um, critique groups. I've done a lot of, um, in, from where I was 10 years ago to where I am today, I'm a much more solid writer, but you have to work on it because you can't just have a good idea. You have to be able to translate it in a way that makes a good book and a good story. There's a craft of writing. So I've done a lot of work in that respect, yeah. I just want to let you know that I did, in fact, uh, post a review on Goodreads just this morning. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, Shirley, yeah. we just have a few more minutes if you'd like to do some last questions or wrap it up a little bit. Um, yeah, well, you know, I wrote the book out of passion. Um, I really didn't have an end result other than I wanted to print it. I wanted to do it. And I had no idea how much it was gonna resonate with readers. I mean, I really did. I was kind of shocked. And actually how many men loved the book? I'm, and how many people bought multiple copies to give away 
to their friends. You know, when I read a good book, I'll tell my friends, oh, you've got to read this book and I'll give them the name and the author and so forth. But people were actually buying the books. Two men bought five copies of the book. One woman even bought like 20 copies of the book to give to her friends. She said, you've got to read this, you know? Wow. So that just, just, I just warmed my heart, but it just totally blew me away. I just wasn't expecting that. And so I just know, you know, that there's something to it. And I did a lot of my writing, what I call under the covers of night. I wake up in the morning at like five in the morning, keep the house dark, get a cup of coffee, turn just a little light on and I'd write. And that way I was still in that kind of flow of the dream state, you know? And so a lot of the writing kind of comes through that way. So I feel like I, I had a lot of help, a lot of influence that wasn't just me in writing the book. And I think maybe that's part of what people are resonating with. Um, so yeah, word of mouth is great. And um, at some point, you know, I've, COVID of course just took a year out of everybody's life. Um, and that's, I kind of laugh when you said that's why people were reading so many books, but I, my guess is not. I think that's just yours. But what this group does is, you know, passionate about the, the breadth and depth of reading. I, I looked at your reading list. I was very impressed. But um, anyway, I, I thank you um, and spread the word um, because I think that's word of mouth is what is one of the things. And at some point I'm going to, I'm going to amp up my pub, my promotion and marketing, but I kind of enjoyed taking a break after writing it and just having that COVID year be just kind of like sitting back and just feeling the love that people had for the book and just enjoying it and, and really feeling validated. So I'll, I'm going to be stepping up my promotion at some point, but you know, writers, like artists, you know, they don't like to promote their book. They like, they, they, they like to do their work, not so much the marketing and promotion part. Surely we have one more question from okay. Kathy Holm in San Bernardino. She's asking if, are you, or will you be interested to travel to women's clubs in California to speak and sign your books now or in the near future? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd love to. I, I really miss the, the, the human connection, you know, the person-to-person -person energy. So um, yeah, yeah, I, I would love to. And it, particularly if I could have, you know, like, okay, um, uh, some group together, so it made sense to go on the road and, and do a, a several in a particular area. Um, I'd love to go out. I'm sure my husband would enjoy accompanying me. Okay. Thank you so much, Shirley. How about if we all give her a big round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Shirley, the CFWC, Shirley, if you yes. will do your last uh, comments and questions and information, let's, let's, we are almost out of time. Yes, it's been a fabulous, fabulous session. I knew it would be. And I want to thank you particularly, Sonia, for all your help with the computer stuff <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and all the people that are involved to make this happen. It's just been a joy. It's a joy to meet you, Shirley, as an author and to explore a whole new section of California. And I hope that everybody will continue to send in all their reports. And I wanna see lots of copies of this book on your reports and you can put it in several different categories. So um, keep up the good work and let's keep ESO going. I thank everyone for being here. It's been a beautiful day. Before everyone leaves, I've been asked to give a housekeeping reminder that chat is not for chat. Chat is really, especially as we're going into the general sessions, ladies, please be respectful and use it only for questions and answers and make sure that that person that's running that chat doesn't have to run through 6 million comments before they know what to bring to the body of, of the women, okay? I've been asked to remind you to please be respectful of what we've been, what we're trying to do with chat. All right, I think we're all done. You can open your mics. You have about five minutes to say hello. And then those of you that'd like to leave are welcome to go. Have a wonderful day. I really enjoyed seeing everyone. <laughs>